Now, uh, this uh, lecture, maybe even more than the last one, I think is entirely relevant to what's being uh, talked about today. Because we have the welfare state is in crisis. In particular, the medical area of it, although you can say this about other things like pensions, Social Security in the United States. Uh, is headed for a, uh, an iceberg, and this may be probably true in other countries as well. And, in, and if you follow the papers in the United States, you know that uh, medical care is in much in controversy. What, are we, what should we do about medical care? Costs are out of control. Uh, it's expensive for people. We have uh, people that uh, are, are, don't have coverage. All kinds of things, terrible things. And um, what uh, is not generally realized is, is that this is what government has brought us. This is the state, the sad state to which the welfare state has delivered us. Although, for some reason, the politicians and the, most of the media com commentators would like you to believe that this is what the free market has brought us to. And the problem with that, of course, is that uh, I can't find the free market anywhere. I've looked around and I don't see a free market in medical care or much else. So uh, I don't think it can be laid at the doorstep of, of, uh, of freedom. It seems like a government failure to me. I want to, uh, in talking about mutual aid, I want to talk about a way that people earlier in our history uh, dealt with the kinds of problems that the government is grappling with today and doesn't seem to be able to solve. And yet people solve them to, in, a, in a very reasonable way. Uh, in the, well, going way back, but I'm thinking more now here of the 19th century and the early 20th century, but the roots are much further back, but that's what I'll concentrate on. Going up to the 1920s, and even into the 30s. Uh, now, let me start by saying, as, as critical as I am as the, of the welfare state, and I've, I've, I've written a book about the welfare state called uh, Tethered Citizens, uh, I'm not critical of the, the reason most people look favorably upon the welfare state. By welfare state, of course, I mean a set of government programs which go beyond simply uh, keeping the civil peace or protecting against the inv invasion from a uh, you know, foreign country. Uh, I'm talking about things that we call social insurance, social security, right? Med medical insurance provided by government, uh, old age pensions, that whole constellation of programs is what I'm thinking of here as uh, the welfare state. And then you could put education in that, in that category as well. So it's government going beyond that, that very uh, basic uh, function of sort of just keeping the peace. A anything beyond that is, is what I'm thinking of as the welfare state. So most people are willing to accept, at least to some extent, that kind of, uh, those kinds of government services. And I don't want to attack anybody for feeling uh, favorably toward them for the following reason. I think they're a mistake ab about how the way they want these, idea these things provided, but the fact that they want them provided, they want them uh, provided, is not really to be criticized. And here, here's why. We live in a world of uncertainty, right? We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. People get sick, people get injured, and it's perfectly reasonable to want to create in this world of uncertainty, some little islands of security and relative certainty where possible. After all, this is why people buy insurance, isn't it? You don't know what's going to happen. Your house could burn down, so you buy insurance. Insurance is a very old institution. Uh, I don't know where it began exactly, but early on there was insurance uh, for people shipping uh, uh, goods across the ocean. I mean, a long time ago. And uh, there was risk of shipwreck and loss of the cargo. And some entrepreneurial type said, I got an idea, uh, pay me uh, this amount of money. And if uh, he calculated the odds of the shipwreck, and if, um, if, if, your ship go, if the ship goes down and you lose your cargo, I'll pay you X amount of money. I'll pay you this amount of money. And the, if the price is right, the person decides this is a good deal, uh, he, go, he takes it. And before you know it, the insurance industry begins to grow out of this. So it, it's mutual it's a, it's a free exchange for mutual benefit. Both sides expect the benefit, and it wouldn't have continued on if, um, if that weren't the case. So wanting to create these little islands of at least relative certainty and, and security uh, 
is a perfectly rational thing to want to do. The problem is when we uh, get uh, talked into uh, the idea that the state is the good provider of this security. There's the problem. Not the desire for security, but, the, but letting the state do it. <clears throat> now, there was a time when the government did a lot less of this, and I'm speaking now of the U.S. in particular. Earlier in, the, in American history, uh, government was far less involved in these kinds of things. The federal government was involved in almost not, not, not at all, certainly prior to the uh, New Deal, and, um, and even more so prior to the Progressive Era at the turn of the century. Uh, now, states and local governments sometimes got involved in uh, uh, income maintenance, you know, help for poor, the poor, or things like that. Uh, but it was far less than it, than it is today. Uh, and people, therefore, had to do it by themselves. Like I said, people, when they're left uh, relatively free, even if they have meager resources, begin to find solutions to the problems. If there's serious enough problems that they want to do something about, they, they engage in some kind of... Uh, uh, creative, imaginative uh, um, uh, problem solving. And they join together with others to do that if it's not something they can do alone. Uh, and I mentioned Tocqueville's observation that Americans uh, created uh, associations for everything, he said. All kinds of things. Something that one person alone couldn't uh, uh, accomplish, he would find like-minded people and create an association to do it. Uh, presumably this wasn't being done in France because Tocqueville wouldn't have uh, remarked about it. If, if it was commonplace in France, I don't think he would have thought it was so remarkable uh, here. So for some reason the French weren't doing it. I don't know why. Maybe they were more prone to look for political solutions to problems. So I want to talk about how low-income people, new immigrants in the United States, and this is true of other English-speaking countries, certainly true of England and uh, Australia and Canada, how they addressed personal issues that the welfare state today is at least theoretically supposed to be addressing. How it created some you know, security in an insecure world or some, some certainty in an uncertain world. They did it through what's known as mutual aid. They formed associations to help themselves. And they, they would often think of them as self-help associations. Uh, in England, they called, them for, uh, they called them friendly societies. In England and Australia, they were known as friendly societies. In the U.S., they were known as fraternal societies, or lodges. And these things were very important culturally. Especially for lower income people and, and immigrants. Wealthy people really didn't need these as much. When I start to talk about the services they provided, you'll understand that somebody with a big bank account and a lot of investments, like you know J.P. Morgan, he wouldn't have uh, seen this as a big necessity in his life, because he had a lot of money and he could get money easily when he needed it. You know, he could sell some securities or something like that. And so, if he needed cash for uh, you know medical attention or something like that, um, he wouldn't have needed to fall back on a mutual aid society. So this is. This is something essentially for you know, people of, of modest means. Now, how many people remember uh, or have watched the Flintstones, the, old, the cartoon The Flintstones, which I think came in in the 60s. It's one of the first like, prime time cartoon shows. Uh, and uh, you know, I remember watching it. And of course, it's still in reruns, I'm sure, on TV land. or My kids grew up watching it. And you probably remember that uh, Fred and Barney were members of the uh, something like the Loyal Order of the Water Buffalo, right? And this was their lodge. Uh, it was a guy's guy's lodge. It was the place the guys could go to, uh, you know, get away from home, get away from the crying kids, <laughs> the wives, the to-do lists, you know, and um, relax a little bit and maybe play some pool, play some cards, have a beer. Uh, and they, of course, they had a sense of solidarity. They wore the funny hats. You know, they wore the furry hat with the horns, and they probably had a secret handshake. You know, to identify them, to give them a sense that we're we're on the inside, and anybody who's not a member of the Water Buffalo is an outsider. 
we're special. And of course, other people had their own clubs where they were special and, and the, 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 you know, no one else was. Uh, now, the honeymoon, uh, sorry, the, uh, I gave it away. The, uh, that, was, that was based on an earlier show which was a live action program called The Honeymooners. And you, you might have seen reruns get shown of these now and then. This was a 50s show starring Jackie Gleason. Has anyone ever seen reruns of it? No one here is old enough to remember it was actually on for the first time, right? But WGN in Chicago on Sunday nights, I think, uh, puts on two, um, two episodes back to back. So if you want to catch it, it's a classic on TV. <clears throat> but Jackie Gleason was a very funny comedian. Art Carney was his buddy. So you had the, uh, you had the Fred and the and the Barney characters, but they weren't prehistoric. Okay, this was 1950s New York. I think, uh, I don't know if it was Manhattan or Queens or one of the boroughs. Uh, Jackie Gleason was a bus driver. These are lower working class uh, people, right? Modest means. Bus driver and his buddy is Ed Norton, a sewer worker. And they both have wives. They don't have kids, unlike, uh, you know, Pebbles and Bam Bam. They don't have kids. Right? So, um, so they're just uh, childless couples, and they're friends. And they have other friends, and they lived in this very bleak apartment, black and white, it was black and white, obviously, uh, back in those days. <clears throat> and they were members of a lodge called the uh, Loyal Order of the uh, Raccoon. So the Water Buffalo was based on that. And they wore raccoon hats, and their, and their, their secret greeting was, you took the tail and you did this. <laughs> this is before Davy Crockett made those hats real popular, and all, kids, all the kids had Davy Crockett hats uh, when I was growing up. Uh, so it was the same thing. It was a way to get away. Maybe the, once a year they'd have a national convention and they'd go to some city, you know, Chicago, and live it up for a few days and have a wild time and swing from chandeliers and, you know, raise a little hell and then go home back to their lives. Uh, now, what they never discussed in these... Uh, the, now, these lodges were based on real things. Obviously, they exaggerated it. They made it funny uh, for entertainment purposes. But these things were actually very important culturally in an earlier time in the United States. And... They were more than just for camaraderie, for sociability, for uh, a way for the, you know, the guys to uh, play cards with their friends or pool. They, they, beginning earlier on, this is already the 50s by the time these things are getting on TV, but earlier than that, even probably earlier than the 19th century, but I'm more familiar with what was happening in the 19th and 20th centuries, these things not only were social institutions, but they were very functional. They provided the kinds of social insurance that today states are expected to provide. Governments are expected to provide by most people. <clears throat> and they worked. They worked reasonably well. You know, nothing's perfect. No one would say the state provision is perfect. The state, income, uh, state welfare, sta uh, welfare states all over the world are, are heading into, uh, you know, fiscal instability because, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're unsustainable. They're, they're victims of changes in the demography, right? We have a huge uh, generation that's going to be retiring soon and start to draw benefits rather than pay benefits in, and that means that many fewer workers have to support uh, uh, retire, the, the retirees, and it's going to be a huge tax burden. No one knows how it's going to be worked out. These, these uh, uh, programs have huge unfunded liabilities. In other words, they've made promises, and they have no provision to keep the promises. Medicare, for example, which provides medical care to retired people, has like a, uh, looking over the next 75 years, about a $35 trillion unfunded liability. I mean, no one knows where the money's going to come from. And yet they've made this promise. They could politically cancel things, but of course that would cause upheaval. And, uh, and, and older people vote in great numbers, so the politicians uh, don't want to have to do that. But no one knows what's going to happen. I mean, it's a problem. Social Security also has an unfunded liability. So these things are shaky. This is true, I think, everywhere. But it's interesting to see how when there was no welfare state to speak of, people just on their own addressed these really very real needs. And like I said earlier, they were legitimate concerns. How, you know, what am I going to do when, if I'm sick and I can't earn my income or if I'm injured? Or what about when I uh, get to the point where I can't work because I'm too old? You know, what am I going to do for uh, income? People were aware of those problems. It wasn't bright politicians who one day said, hey, you know what, we better address this problem because no one ever thought of this before. People thought of it, and people were doing something about it. So I want to talk a little bit about what they were doing and um, see whether it has any lessons for today. Now, I'm not going to say that all we need to do is recreate the lodge system. 
I mean, they, that would be very unrealistic. That was the product of a particular culture. The culture has changed quite a bit. And it's not just that we could, oh, just, let's just start these things up again. But it does indicate what people came up with back then. We might speculate on how things would have evolved if the government hadn't crowded it out, had crowded out the system by basically competing with it. And we might, we might wonder, you know, what, how it might have evolved and had it just continued on. Or, and using it as a model, we could speculate on what uh, people might do today if they found out they had to fall back on their own devices and not look to government to pr provide these services. So the best book to read on this subject, if you're interested, is by David Beto. He's a historian at the University of Alabama. And he's written in the Freeman about this, so if you put his name in our search engine, you'll come up with a few articles by him. Uh, but his book is called From Mutual Aid to the Welfare State. That's the main title, From Mutual Aid to the Welfare State. Um, I don't know if I put it in the readings there. Fraternal Societies and Social Services, 1890 to 1967. So he takes it up to fairly recently, 1967. I mean, it seems like a long time ago, but it's... <clears throat> Historically, it's, uh, it's not that long ago. So Fraternal Societies and Social Services, 1890 to 1967. So, in essence, what people did when they couldn't look to politicians, and, were, and that wasn't their frame of mind back then, was they set up associations, a la Tocqueville, to um, provide self-help in these areas. They, somebody came up with the idea that, look, we're, we're, if we pay dues while we're healthy, not only do we get the camaraderie, the social gathering place, but we can be saving the money, investing the money, and then if somebody's in need, he, he draws from the fund. If he's sick and can't work, he can draw from the fund. Uh, if, he, if the breadwinner dies, there's money that the, the, you know, the survivor and the, ch the children can draw from for uh, uh, burial or tie them over, things like that. If person's out of work, needs to be helped out while he's looking for his next job, he can draw benefits. Uh, and this is what these uh, mutual aid societies did increasingly. And they were very, very uh, entrepreneurial. They wanted to attract members. These were owned by the members now. These weren't private companies in the sense of profit-making companies. Okay, the members owned it. There was a board of directors, but there was no, there were, there, there was no residual claimant. Okay, there was no profit that uh, that a board or uh, the owner uh, kept in the end. All money went into the club. It was a club. You could think of it as like a mutual association, like a mutual fund or something. And in order to attract members, they were concerned to offer attractive benefits, an attractive uh, dues schedule, because they were rivals with other clubs. And so you got, you got this good com if, uh, effects from competition. People thinking ahead, how can we make our club more attractive to get people? And, um, and so it was, a very, it was a vibrant environment. A big city might have a lot of these things. Some of these were based on ethnicity or uh, nationality, but others were not. Others w were not of any specific um, ethnicity or a nationality, so you may have a mixture. Uh, recent immigrants might be attracted to one that, that was set up by uh, people from their old country who were here already and had set up groups. So you might have a, you know, a Lithuanian lodge or a mutual aid society where someone knew the oh, people from my, my country, I've, you know, I had this in common, uh, they would help, help make me welcome, introduce me to the new city. You can see how it would also have that function but also provide this safety net, to some extent, for the vicissitudes of life. Um, this was a time when blacks and whites probably weren't mixing that much, given the time in our history. And, but that didn't keep uh, um, blacks, African Americans, from having the same services. They set up their own organizations. There was a very big one, national one, that uh, was founded in Little Rock, Arkansas, called the Mosaic Templars of America. Here's a handbill. They used to give out the Mosaic Templars of America. Fraternal insurance, assets over $750,000. Membership, $100,000, operating in 26 states, including Central America. Policies issued on adequate rate basis and amounts up to $1,000. Age limits, 16 to 50. So they were actually 
boasting about the social insurance aspects of it. It wasn't just, hey, this is a club where you can meet people and, you know, play cards and play pool. This became the big attraction. These services became a big attraction to, jo to joining the club. And they, in a way, they mirrored what the first wealth, modern welfare state was doing, which was in Prussia and then unified Germany in the uh, late 19th century. If you go to the Social Security website, administration website here in the U.S., and there's a page on the history of Social Security. They have a picture, I think they still do, they have a picture of the person they regard as the father of Social Security. Anybody know who that might be? Who? Bismarck, right. Otto von Bismarck. Almost universally acknowledged as the founder of the modern welfare state. In the 1870s and 80s, he begins to put in a series of programs that are, provide what we think of a social insurance uh, to, uh, you know, for the population. And that included work, things like workman's compensation, so you got hurt on the job, the, there was a benefit, uh, if you got sick and couldn't work, there was a benefit, burial insurance, pensions, a, a social security type system. Now, why did he do this? Why did the government get into this? Well, he, he said that the reason was that, that uh, in a Christian nation, the government should provide these services to, to people in need. But, and maybe he meant that, I don't know. Maybe he was sincere to some extent about that. But uh, he was also clear about his uh, other reason, which might have been the more important reason. It was a way of keeping the working class loyal to the emperor and to the regime. Politicians long ago discovered, back in ancient times, that if you give the population things, they are happy about that. They think they're getting something for free, and they look with favor on the politicians and rulers who are giving these, these goodies. And Bismarck went to the emperor and said, you know, there are, we have rivals for the allegiance of the working class, and we could lose the allegiance unless we do something to keep them loyal. Who were the rivals? The rivals were the Marxist party, right? The Marxists were saying uh, the system is uh, corrupt, it's no good, it's contrary to the interests of workers, join us and help us bring the socialist revolution. So that, that was creating some turmoil. You also had rivals, though, in the Liberal Party, more or less laissez-faire party. It wasn't pure laissez-faire, but it was, you know, not bad. And they were vying for the, uh, the support of working people, telling them about the benefits of free trade and economic freedom. And so the ruling regime did not have a sure lock on with the working class. And this was a calculated attempt by Bismarck to keep them in you know, on board. And so they begin to roll out, year by year, a series of these benefits. And I guess it pretty much worked, because they never did have the, uh, the Marxist revolution. And uh, <clears throat> they didn't have a liberal revolution. Although there were some periods of free trade in this time in Germany. <clears throat> so, he sets the model. But before the Americans get enamored with this model, they're doing these things for themselves. And they're doing similar things, but totally through voluntary mutual aid. So they have similar things. They have sickness, coverage for sickness and injury and burial. But they, and they do more than that. They have, they set up some of these lodges which are linked with other chapters around the country. So you have sort of national confederations, orphanages, sanitariums, hospitals, schools, all kinds of things. I mean, they get very, very elaborate to provide services that people want and are willing to uh, pay for, and are doing it now not through for-profit business. I mean, the market is not just for-profit business. It, can, it also includes things like mutual aid associations. <clears throat> These things were very uh, popular and very well subscribed. Uh, the the uh, New Hampshire Bureau of Labor in 1884 uh, stated in a report the tendency to join fraternal organizations for the purpose of obtaining care and relief in the event of sickness and insurance for family, for the family in case of death, 
is well nigh universal. To the laboring classes and those of moderate means, they offer many advantages not to be had elsewhere. So these things were, were pretty popular. People were, saw that they, they had this need, and here was a way to uh, look after it, and look after your family. And so this was not just some you know, minority of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a city's population that was, was getting into these things. These were, these were uh, you know, after church membership, this was like the next biggest thing. This was, these were very prominent in people's lives. And, of course, they've been, devo uh, they've been uh, studied uh, quite closely by scholars over the years, but they don't ever sort of, uh, in, at the public policy level, it's as if these things never existed. Because the whole assumption seems to be if government doesn't do this, you know, forget about it. There are going to be people dying in the street, and no one's going to have, no one's going to be able, except for the rich, are going to be able to afford uh, medical care, and, you know, it's going to be uh, just a disaster. We're going to go back to those bad old days, because nobody... Hardly anybody knows beyond the outside of academia that these things existed or what they did. <clears throat> now they did something else which is of particular relevance today. They, they addressed the problem of medical care for, like I say, for modest uh, income people. Uh, you know, today we're trying to figure out what to do with 47 million uninsured people, although that's a bit of a misleading number because if you disaggregate it, you see that it includes many different categories of people. Some that are, don't seem quite as needy as others. Like I think something like 40% of that 47 million are in, uh, have like $50,000 of income or more. They've chosen not to buy health insurance. Or it also counts, it counts everybody in a year, in a given year who has been uninsured, no matter how long they've been uninsured. So if you're between jobs for a month or so and don't have insurance, Nevertheless, that gets counted in the year's overall figure of uninsured, even though you got insurance within a short time. Uh, so there's, there's various reasons why that number is uh, not nearly as, uh, as huge. A lot of people in that number are eligible for existing programs, but for some reason haven't taken advantage of them, like Medicaid. I mean, uh, yet they get counted. So it's a kind of a misleading uh, number. Anyway, but this is supposedly a big puzzle. How are you going to extend health insurance to uh, you know, basically everybody and how to make it affordable. And of course there's this monstrosity working itself through the Houses of Congress that uh, luckily seems to be maybe uh, getting derailed, but that would create a huge amount of hardship. And I, if I have time toward the end, I'll give you some more indication about this or you can bring it up in the question and answers, what's, you know, what's wrong with what they're talking about. But the, the big story to me is that <clears throat> they're not even aware that when people were left basically alone they figured out how to band together with other people to address this. And the way they did it in the, in the area of medical care is through a, a device that was known as Lodge Practice. Somebody got the bright idea that these lodges, which of course are collecting dues from their members, they're pooling resources, could in effect, buy medical care wholesale and then resell it to the members retail. You know, there's strength in numbers. These people are already together. They're already paying dues. They had a common interest in, uh, in kind of addressing problems that they all faced, the need for medical care being one of them. And I don't know who came up with the idea, but they began to uh, contract with a doctor for a, fi for a fixed amount of money over the year, and in return, the doctor then offered basic medical services, you know, general practicing, practitioner services, including house calls, which of course is, are extinct today, I guess, uh, to the members of the lodge and their and their families through during that year. Now, this seems this seems pretty interesting. Uh, it didn't uh, it didn't address everything. You know, if somebody needed a serious operation. And you need a surgeon, you know, they didn't have a surgeon on call. But as far as the basic care, uh, this was one of the benefits then of joining the lodge. That you had access to this doctor and, uh, for, um, for, in return for your dues, and you could call upon him. Uh, this, was, um, this became uh, an extremely big uh, uh, attraction. Uh, in, in, a, in, in getting members to join your lodge rather than someone else's lodge. You could brag about what, um, which doctor you had and 
what the results were, the fact that uh, your, your membership was healthy, and, you know, uh, and this is why you should join us. Of course, they didn't want sick people, ser seriously ill people joining, because that would, you know, that would have dragged down the system. But that, that's not what they're, they were, these were not charitable organizations. Okay, these were, these were self-help organizations. So uh, an ill person would have to maybe rely on charity if, if uh, his needs were beyond his own means. But that's not the function that these things were uh, uh, performing. Uh, okay, how did it work? Well, they had to, they had to find a doctor who would um, be the right doctor. So they, uh, they would have a committee to interview doctors. They'd call in the, the doctors from the community who were interested in this, and they would uh, grill them and interview them and maybe talk to uh, former patients or present patients of the doctors. And then the, uh, the lodge would vote, the membership would vote on which doctor to uh, write the contract with. And it was a competitive situation. They weren't just looking for the low bidder, they were looking for a combination of, uh, of attractive uh, uh, amount of money that was being asked, plus the reputation and, uh, and um, service they could expect from the doctor. And it was a very uh, important uh, time for the lodge when it, when it came time to decide who the doctor would be. And this worked out reasonably well. People were happy about it, and like I said, it was a basis on which you might join a lodge, one lodge rather than another lodge. Uh, it, brought, it brought medical care within the reach of people who uh, otherwise would have had difficulty just with regular fee-for-service, uh, the regular fee-for-service system. Uh, just to give an example, um, the average cost of lodge practice to an individual member was one to two dollars a year. So, in that time, that was a, that was a day's wage, one to two dollars was a day's wage. So, for a day's wage, you could get a year's worth of, uh, of medical care for you and your family. That was, a pretty good, that was a pretty good buy, okay? Because don't forget, you had the large number <coughs> paying the doctor. Uh, why did the doctor go into this? Well, because he had, first of all, he had a uh, certain, he knew that he, he was going to have a certain amount of money up, up front. I don't know if they paid him all up front, but he knew that during the cal that calendar year, he could count on this amount of money. And even though he knew that he had to then render services and he didn't know quite how much he'd have to render during the year because he didn't know how many calls he'd get, he might have a rough estimate. And if you have some experience, probably had a rough idea how much uh, time that was going to be, but you couldn't know exactly. But it was still worth that. It was worth it to know I have, okay, this amount of money I can count on. And so it was worth it to the doctor, and of course it was worth it to the lodge, the members, because they, they, um, they had this access to, the, to, to these services, which included house calls and things like that. So it was a good deal, and it, and it, it, it worked reasonably well, and it, um, and it endured for a while. And I'll tell you, give you some reasons why it didn't continue. But it's, it's interesting how people hit on this uh, uh, method of uh, solving a problem that faced them. How, how, do you, how do you make sure you're going to have medical care for you and your family uh, when you need it? Uh, just to give you some numbers here, although numbers I realize can uh, be boring, but uh, by here's a, uh, there were two organizations, the two biggest uh, leading providers of lodge practice were the Foresters and the Fraternal Order of Eagles. By 1910, both organizations had 2,000 doctors under contract to look after the medical needs of 600,000 members. So we're talking about, you know, pretty, pretty big numbers. And then, like I said, 1910. <clears throat> In, uh, among blacks in New Orleans, there were 600 fraternal societies with lodge practice during the 1920s. So, you know, these things were not, these weren't just some unusual uh, 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 things that happened now and then. These were fairly common, in the, certainly in the major cities. <clears throat> now, everybody seemed happy with, these, uh, with this setup, this arrangement. Except, not everybody was happy. There was a group that wasn't happy about this. And who do you think that might be? Would, wouldn't have been happy about this uh, growing and developing lodge practice uh, institution? Well, doctors didn't get the contracts, but there was even, a, that might not have been an organized group, but there was an organized group that didn't, that didn't like it. And I think her, somebody said it, I think. Sorry? No, I don't know of any, I don't know that they had any problems. I hadn't heard they had, but uh, 
Well, yeah, you're getting close to it. The medical societies, the AMA and the organized state medical societies, they did not, organized medicine did not like it. And they didn't like it because it was driving down their income. This was a break from traditional fee-for-service income where you, just, uh, where you just came in, you know, ad hoc, paid for a particular service. Uh, obviously, this was a very different way to do business. And uh, they feared change. They feared that this was going to uh, affect the whole income structure, income schedule. And they were, they, their fear was that their incomes would fall, that the price of medicine would be too low. Now today, of course, that's very different. We're, we're concerned with the price of medicine being too high. So the, 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 it's funny to think of a time when the, the people, some people at least, worried that the price of medicine uh, was too low. So they decided they were going to stop it. They were going to not permit, if they could help it, uh, lodge practice from going on. In England, early in the 20th century, the government begins to get into uh, uh, subsidizing medical care and, and, and formal medical programs, and uh, which of course made it more difficult for lodge practice to to work. Because why would people pay through the do, through their dues if they're already paying through the taxes, and they had no choice about that. You're going to cut back somewhere, right? If you're being taxed and getting medical benefits, why would you pay extra for medical benefits? So it had a way of crowding out the mutual aid uh, provision of this idea. So that helped to wither and uh, you know, sh uh, help kill lodge practice. In the U.S., it wasn't that obvious because the U.S. The government doesn't get into uh, uh, providing medical care uh, in that sort of way. It's much later... It begins only with uh, uh, elderly people and poor people. And so uh, it's more subtle. The doctors uh, begin to put the uh, screws to, to lodge practice by uh, stigmatizing the doctors who would, who would go into it. They would say, this, no, no self-respecting doctor would sign a contract with a lodge. It's like he's, he sees himself like a tradesman or a boot black. You know, he's like a, he's like a low-level laborer signing a contract to... Uh, and, let, and not only signing a contract, but letting sort of lay people, working class people, quiz them, interrogate them before they hired them. Can you imagine that? A dignified doctor having to submit the questioning from like, here's the lodge, and I'm this doctor. I'm going to take questions from you and justify myself in order to get your, and grovel in order to get your contract. There's the meaning. So they would say the doctors are obviously unqualified or else they wouldn't even subject themselves to this. And not only that, they didn't go to big name medical colleges and you know at big at endowed universities these doctors tended to go to private medical schools private medical colleges and there was so there was this um, class division between doctors who went to say Harvard or some big endowed university and those that went to private medical colleges now private medical colleges typically were set up by doctors they weren't they weren't inferior but they were not big name endowed uh, schools, and they they were paid by uh, they were tuition supported, not endowment supported, and so it was easy to stigmatize them. He went to a medical college, you know. I went to Harvard or or Penn or someplace. He went to you know Jones's Medical College, and so it was easy to stigmatize the lodge uh, doctors as inferior and giving inferior uh, service. Uh, of course, that wasn't enough. So they threatened their licenses. There was licensing in these days. And the doctors who graduated medical colleges uh, had to go through the same certification procedures as the doctors that went through the big universities. So they couldn't say, ah, they're, they're quacks, they're unlicensed. I'll say a word about licensing in a moment. I don't mean to, I'm not approving of it. In fact, it's one of the problems. But it was another way to just stigmatize them. And they would, um, go, to hot, they would go to the hospitals and, and, and uh, that, that would extend privileges to these lodge doctors and say, uh, suspend the privileges or else we will take uh, action against you, the hospital. In other words, they, put, they did everything they could to put pressure on the lodge doctors to, uh, uh, to not um, uh, go into that form of uh, practice because it was, they found it threatening. Now, you know, we think of doctors, or at least we used to think of doctors as almost like saints. Okay? They, they, it's just almost as if doctors weren't, didn't take money. They, you didn't even pay a doctor, right? The doctor never talked about money. In the old days, I don't, today, of course, you, they, have, they all have like insurance administrators, right? And 
uh, specialists who are experts in the, all the new software for filing the insurance. And, but they, rarely did you talk to the doctor about money. Mon money was uh, something that the, you know, someone else on the staff took care of. The doctor was like above that. He's, he's in the white coat and then, don't talk to me about money. I don't, I'm not in this for the money. You know, that was the whole, that was the whole uh, at least the image. So the lodge doctor practice, the lodge practice kind of thing, uh, seemed to erode that because here's a doctor, you know, bidding, trying to underbid his, uh, his, his arrival who might be also trying to get the contract. And, and so that was, you know, that was seen as sort of grubby. We're not tradesmen, we're doctors. What are you doing this for? So they didn't like this. But think about it from the point of view of the lodge member. It gave the lodge member a huge amount of control over uh, his medical care. He could ask questions of the doctor before it, the doctor was hired. It, it, was, it was a form of empowerment, and the lodge members seemed quite happy with this situation. But organized medicine put the screws to it. Uh, I want to say about, word about licensing, because it was very important. They would threaten the licenses of, uh, of lodge doctors if they continued on with this. And of course, the medical societies weren't just voluntary organizations. You know, if they were just purely voluntary, you might say, okay, well, they're a voluntary group and they didn't like something, so they spoke out against it. You know, we would, we would be harder to complain about that. But the medical societies were always linked to, this, to government, of course, state governments primarily, through the licensing function and the medical school accreditation program. Uh, there was a point in the early 19th, 20th century when uh, the organized medicine thought there were too many medical schools turning to out too many doctors, which was a threat to their incomes, right? Supply and demand. More providers, lower fees. They didn't like that. So they got this, they got the Rockefeller, I think it was the, the Rockefeller Foundation, to publish this huge report called the Flexner Report that said, we have too many medical schools and we need to tighten up on certification and rid ourselves of some of these schools. And they did that. And by some percentage, I'm not sure of the percentage, a whole bunch of schools basically were closed. But guess which schools tended to be closed? More or less. I mean, this is the, the dominant schools that were closed. Were, sorry? Well, not, but among the private schools, the schools that tended to get closed were the ones that were run by African Americans and women. Because they had trouble getting into the, the mainstream schools, right? There was still, there was cultural uh, bias, discrimination. Uh, why are women running to become doctors? They should be, uh, no more than nurses certainly, right? But ideally they should be home, right? I mean, that was the attitude. So it was hard for a woman to get into a regular medical school and, and probably harder for, an, I don't know, harder probably for an African American or somebody of some ethnic, uh, you know, seemingly foreign ethnic uh, origin. Well, women and African Americans did what people do when they're more or less free. They set up their own institutions. They said, back with you, we'll set up our own. Just like there were black colleges all over the country and women's colleges. So, uh, but these are the ones that had the screws put to them by the tightening up of the accreditation pro uh, process in order to cut down on the number of doctors. And you would think, you would figure the ones that suffer first would be the, minor the minority or, in this, or uh, the case of women. Um, and, and of course... Similar with, with licensing. Uh, there, was a, there was a book done, a lot of research done by a historian whose name was Ronald Hamaway on why medical licensing came in in the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century. And what he did was go through the medical societies, each state had a medical society, go through the minutes of their meetings where licensing was discussed because the doctors would say, you know what, we need licensing or we need tighter licensing. Uh, and the re he would discuss, he would read the debates, why, what they were saying, how were they defending this. It was never, we need to protect patients from quack doctors. That was not the concern. The concern was not the patients. The concern was their incomes. There are too many doctors. Licensing is a way to meter, right, the flow of new doctors into the market. You don't want a free flow. They don't want a free flow because that, it's hard to keep your income high if there's people coming in and competing you, with you and lowering, lowering income. So there's a history of doctors, and not the only profession to do this, it's probably common to everything we formally call a profession, like the lawyers and, you know, you used to become a lawyer by apprenticing with a lawyer, not, you didn't have to go to law school. You apprenticed with someone who had a good reputation, and then you carried on from there. That all changed, of course. <clears throat> so, um, you can see why lodge practice would have created such animosity. But look what it was doing for regular people. Look at the value it was providing for regular people. 
Like I said, J.P. Morgan didn't need this. He could have a family doctor on, you know, retainer, and anytime he needed it, he had the money to handle it. But this was a way for working class people, new immigrants, low, lower income people to band together and get the stuff they needed in terms of all the social insurance and, uh, and, and medicine. Stuff that today you know, puzzles us. How are we going to do this in a sustainable way? But these lodges were successful. They weren't, bank they weren't on the verge of bankruptcy the way welfare states are. They weren't, you know, look at the debt the government runs. So much of it because they're providing these services. Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, Obama conceded the other day that Medicare and Medicaid are the, one of the primary reasons the deficit is out of control. Well, who's surprised by that? Well, these things weren't routinely going out of business. They were thriving. So what happened to them? I've got to keep an eye on the time. We're going to noon? Is that right? Okay. What happened to these things? Well, they, they got crowded out because government begins to get into competition with them. <clears throat> in England, it's a little bit earlier. It's in the first decade of the 20th century. In the U.S., it's a little bit after that. The states begin to get into this. The federal government doesn't really do it until the New Deal when we get welfare and you know, workman's comp and things like that. But the states are doing it earlier than that. And it begins to displace the lodge function. And the lodges start to wither because if they don't have these uh, unique services to provide and the people are already paying through taxes for things, why are you going to pay dues to get you the same thing? I mean, it's just sort of it's just the, uh, the way the incentives work. Uh, but there was great concern when the government begins to get into this, both in England and in the United States. Because one of the things that these lodges uh, pushed as an advantage to, to joining was the pride in self-help. And they, there was a character element to this. Uh, in other words, it wasn't just a way to look after you and your family. It was a way to do it, not, I don't mean on your own in the sense of individually, but you here you were looking out for your family. You weren't shifting the responsibility to someone else. You were getting together with people who had common need, and you were taking charge of this. This was a way of, they sold uh, memberships on this basis. The Templars uh, liked to do this. They, they, they stressed how, how it, character was such a big part of this. So when the, when the bureaucrats, the bureaucratic class, the intellectual class, the academics begin to say, you know, the state, the welfare state is the wave of the future. They went to, they went to Prussia, they went to Germany and studied what Bismarck did and said, this is the future. The 20th century is approaching. This is... This is the way that things are going to be. The state is now, the Jeffersonian view of the state is quaint. It's old. It's, it's, eight, it's 18th century. It's 17th century. We're, we've evolved past that. Enough of that little government that doesn't do much more than just keep the peace. This is what government is now. So as they're talking this up and as the politicians are getting interested in this because, hey, yeah, this is great. I'd rather be running a big government than a small government. It's more prestige, more power, more money. But the people that were dedicated to the mutual aid said, wait a second, I sense danger here. This is going to be bureaucracy giving out money. What, what about the character side of it? What about the moral side? What about the self-help side? Aren't we going to be losing something? And they tried to, they fought it. They actually tried to fight it and say, no, we're going to lose something. It's not, mutual, mutual aid's not just about money. It's about we're doing it. We make the decisions. You think we're going to make the decisions if a, bureau, if a bureaucracy is running things? They gave all the prophetic warnings that we kind of uh, talk about today when, when we call for uh, uh, changes. There is a relationship between the labor movement and mutual aid because obviously most of the people in the mutual aid uh, movement are workers. Uh, there might have been some proprietors, but by and large they were probably employees. And they, in England especially, they thought that the government taking over these functions was not only a way of uh, making the mutual aid societies disappear, but of undermining even the labor movement, which was attempting to get higher wages and, and better benefits and things like that. They said if the state takes this over, it's going to take the wind out of the sails for higher wages, it's going to destroy the labor movement, it's, gonna, it's, go, it's going to uh, subordinate our independence. They always talk about independence. They said, why do we want to get these favors from government? The government's the upper class. In England, of course, much more, much more structured class uh, society than America ever was. So they said, what makes us think that the upper class that runs the government has our interests, the working class at heart? Why do we want to get benefits from them? Aren't they going to just use it to subordinate us and, and take away our independence? So there's early, 
early on, there's, there's resistance to government getting involved in setting up a welfare state for those kinds of reasons. Now, what happened? The leaders essentially got sort of bought off. The government bureaus would say, okay, look, we'll take the leader of your organization, we'll put him on our board. So he's now helping to make the decisions. And, of course, the, the, the leader often would say, okay, I like that idea. I get some prestige. I'm now on an official board. And it co-opted the movement. A lot of people were, you know, they, their vigilance sort of uh, weakened. And they said, oh, okay, if we're going to have input, I guess it's better. Now, the, so you get, you get a subordination and a withering away of these groups. They also hurt themselves. In the U.S., some of the bigger lodges got the states to pass laws in order to keep, hurt their competition or new, comp new competition from coming in. They would say you have to have a minimum amount of assets or a minimum, uh, um, they would want to set a minimum dues, dues uh, structure so that somebody couldn't come in and undercut them to get their members, right, to lure away their members to the new group. So they begin to uh, ask for laws, they, the protectionist laws to keep the competition down. Businesses often do this kind of thing. Well, why not mutual aid societies? But it came back to hurt them. Because as laws get on the books, you know, they get interpreted and they get uh, enforced in a way that maybe you didn't have in mind when you first wanted the law. And so it ended up hurting the very people who asked for these laws. So over time, and certainly into the New Deal, when the federal government gets into it in a big way, these things fade and change. Some of them still exist today, but they don't do the kinds of services that they, um, that they used to do. They're, they're very different. Now they're almost purely social. Uh, and, well, we do have some service organizations like the Lions Club, but those are very different. The, those, their functions are more charitable, like the Lions Club, they collect uh, eyeglasses for poor people and stuff like that. So it's more outward. It's not so much providing services to their own members. Uh, and so these things have basically passed and become extinct. Uh, and it's a great, it's a great loss because we don't know what would have evolved out of them had they been just allowed to go on without the government getting involved. Um, Anyway, I'll stop there. You may have questions or comments on, on such things, but I hope, I hope it's interesting. I'm just wondering what uh, prevented, I, I don't know if it prevented it, but it seems like it prevented the same parallel with the insurance companies, of the, like medical societies keeping those from getting involved. It seems like they kind of serve the same purpose. I'm not quite understanding your, your how, question. How you said that medical societies pretty much shut out the, the fraternal organizations for the payments and things like that. I was just wondering how the insurance companies got around the medical societies trying to prevent them ah. doing the same things. So did the, were the medical, I, I don't, uh, the question is um, the medical societies took action against the lodge practice in various ways. So would they have engaged in similar strategies when, in, when medical insurance uh, came along? Um, I don't know the history of medical insurance, uh, but it's not quite the same thing because the medical uh, insurance companies don't put doctors on retainer, right, for a fixed uh, annual sum. So you wouldn't um, get that kind of competition. On the other hand, insurance companies do uh, look for, to try to uh, get the best deals. But I think insurance begins like so much of it is today, uh, where you still go to your doctor. Uh, but the insurance companies can say we'll only reimburse this amount for X, service X. I don't know whether there was friction there, uh, whether medical societies uh, embraced the idea of medical insurance or didn't embrace it. They might have embraced it on the grounds that, uh, hey, more and more people now will be re less reluctant to go to a doctor because they got coverage for it. So you can see how they might say, no, this is a good thing. This means people will come to doctors more often. I'd have to research the exact history of medical insurance. Yes? Okay, the question is, is, is it would be better to let things get as bad as they can get a in order to uh, have people then turn to the market, the free market as the solution? Or would it do the opposite? Uh, yeah, this is a strategy that's uh, known as revolutionary defeatism. <laughs> I think Lenin actually embraced it at one time before he get, was in power. Let, let things get really bad 
And that way people, and then have the ideas ready, right? Have the libertarian solution there, talk, be talking about it, so that when people say, what are we going to do? Someone can say, well, look, they've been talking about the solution right along. Free markets, let's do it. I, my fear is it really wouldn't work that way. I think as, as, if things get really bad in terms of economics, that, uh, you know, governments thrive on fear. And so the worse things seem to get, I think the more that will strengthen uh, the call for, hey, somebody do something. I mean, look what happened with the economic uh, crisis of the last year or so. Uh, people were not so resistant. I mean, there was some concern about it, you know, all the bailouts are going to Wall Street, but, but no, hardly anyone was saying the government shouldn't uh, do anything or bail any, anybody out and just free the market. We weren't hearing that, although libertarians have been writing about free markets for a very long time. So I don't think it would happen. Most people don't understand economics. That's the problem. So if things seem to get really bad, I think they would say uh, the government needs to do more. I think that would be their first, because they've been learning that forever. Now, luckily, uh, as it is today, look, most people in medical care, most people will say in polls that they're satisfied with their coverage and with their doctors. They, they acknowledge, they say, that, oh yeah, there's a problem for the people that don't have coverage, but I'm pretty happy, that by and large, that's what people say. I'm pretty happy with my coverage. I understand other people are, you know, have a tough time. So, if they believe that a, that a government plan, like it's been talked about now, will tamper with their own co current situation, then they get nervous and they begin to say, no, I don't like that, which is what's happening in the polls, right? You see that Obama's handling of this has now dropped below 50%. And uh, that's one reason Congress is beginning to drag its feet and why they're going to miss their deadline in August, which, by the way, is a good thing, right? The, it's like it's like in college basketball, you want to run out the clock. That's the best hope we have right now is to run out the clock. So I, my fear is, no, they would turn to, if things seem to get really bad, even for them personally, they'd say government do something. I mean, I don't think we've taught people economics that well yet. They don't understand economics. They'll say, those vicious insurance companies, you know, they did this to us. So I think uh, we can't just hope it just gets worse and worse and worse and people will then discover the free market.